Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to our worship service. If you're making your way in, come on in and find a seat, and we'll get going. So does everybody know what day it is? It's Christmas Eve day, that's right. So we're glad that you're here to worship with us. You know, God came, God sent his son on, we celebrate that this day. And you know, I th have been thinking that Christmas really isn't the, the, the apex of Jesus' story, but it's the beginning of God implementing his plan. And I was thinking on my drive here this morning, I said, what, would, what from God's perspective is the biggest problem with this world right now? Now, I'm not, that's a rhetorical question. But I think you all come up with an answer that's different than the one that I'm going to propose, and that is the biggest problem in this world today is your sin and my sin. We are sinners. We have no hope because of that. But Jesus came... And the beginning of the plan started at Christmas, and that was so that God could take care of the biggest problem in this world. Your biggest problem, my biggest problem. So that's what we're celebrating, the beginning of that plan. So I'm glad you're here. We are going to start our service, which is, has the theme of love. The Advent candle will focus on that. And so let's stand together and let's read responsibly a scripture that highlights some of the passages love in the Bible. So just follow your cue. So the word became human and made his home among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness. And we have seen his glory in the glory of the Father's one and only Son. For this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only Son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. God sent his Son into the world, not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. So I am now giving you a new commandment. Love each other. Just as I have loved you, you should love each other. Your love is enough will prove in the world that you are my disciples. Let's continue in worship and song. Thank you. 
Good morning. It is great to have you here with us this morning as we gather together, as we come together to, to worship and to celebrate and remember all that God has done for us in sending Jesus to, to be born for us, to live among us, to die on our behalf. And so we're glad that you're here with us this morning to celebrate that fact with us. If you're new or visiting, my name is Tim. I'm the, the senior pastor here at Three Lakes Evangelical Free Church. We're glad that you chose to be here with us this morning. A couple announcements to bring to your attention. One is that this evening at 6 o'clock we will gather here again for a, a Christmas Eve candlelight service. We'd invite you to be a part of for that. And also in, in January, starting in January, we're going to start kind of a, a program of scripture memory together as a church. And so talk a little bit more about that. M.A. Ogren is going to come and encourage you to join us in that. which I will talk about more next week on specifically what that's going to look like. But I'm going to, um, if you look at it, the second paragraph says, the benefits of memorizing Bible verses are worth the effort it takes to know them by heart. So last week I mentioned to you how um, it's easy just to go to church and say, I'm comfortable doing what I'm doing, and then when the hard stuff comes, it's like, no thanks, I'm going to take a pass. So today I'd just like to talk about um, some of the reasons and the benefits of memorizing scripture. And um, we've all heard that scripture is um, the instruction manual for life. And especially at this Christmas time, if you think of your instruction manuals for your car or if you put together IKEA furniture, when you're done with the doing it, you put it down and you really aren't that interested in picking it up. And no one says, I love the author of this instruction manual. <laughs> but this is where scripture is unique in that <clears throat> scripture is a love story. It's a love story of God to us. And memorizing scripture helps us commune with him, communicate with him, show him praise and respect for what he's done for us. And memorizing scripture, when you are at a loss for words, you can say, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. We can hide verses in our heart that allow us to commune with him better. Another thing is <clears throat> our goal is to become transformed and be more Christ-like. Um, one of my favorite verses that I've memorized is in the L New Living Translation, and it's um, let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. And I just think we are so inundated with how the world thinks. We read about it, we are all on the internet, we hear people in the community, in the grocery store, and how do we think differently and God can transform us as we put verses in our heart to change the way we think. That's how we become more transformed to be Christ-like. Third way is um, uh, when you have uh, talking to friends or loved ones or family uh, and they say things and you know there's that scripture verse. Um, Mary Jo uh, Schenke was talking to me at pastor's um, open house last Sunday and she said when someone quotes scripture to you at just the right time it's just so it just moves your soul because a they knew it in their heart and they chose to share it with you it's very very powerful and we should be doing that to um, those in our church family and those in our um, our uh, physical family and then communicating to other um, unbelievers we some of us um, are, are the extent of our theology is Jesus loves me this I know but how many of us are ready to say um, answer questions of who is God why are we here what's the problem I'm a good person and can we quote scripture the power is not us giving people an argument 
But it, the power is the scripture, which is what pierces the heart. And so we need to know um, doctrine to be able to, doctrinal verses to be able to share those. And then finally, it's sin. So many of us, well, all of us, <laughs> have besetting sins that we have struggled with, some for years, some forever, our whole lives, and some um, we just don't get on top of. And we know that there's the um, armor of God, there is one offensive piece of armor, and that's the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, right? So, you know, when we are looking to uh, not fall back into sin, to try to conquer our own sins, we need to um, call the word of God into our memories. So, last week I challenged you. Um, I don't know how many of you did think, how many verses do I really know? And hopefully it was enough to say, I could maybe benefit from trying this with the church. So next week we'll talk about what this is going to look like. But um, I just want to say there's going to be no, um, no failures in this, because even if you learn two verses, that's two verses you didn't know before. But the benefits are amazing. Thank you, M.A., and yeah, I just going to encourage you to, to take part in this and see the value in, in memorizing God's Word. Um, now, Chuck Bodie going to come. He's going to share with a little message from our church board. Thank you, Tim. Good morning, and Merry Christmas to the church. Um, <laughs> I'm filling in for uh, our... Uh, Chairman of the board, Scott Epler, uh, who can't be here today, has some family uh, obligations. So, just imagine that I'm Scott Epler. Put a little, put a little hair on me, and another six inches of height, and you can, you can <laughs> use your imagination. Anyway, uh, traditionally, about this time of year, we ask the congregation to uh, donate to a gift for our great pastors that we have. And so I am uh, honored to have the privilege of awarding those to our pastors. And Ian? <clears throat> Tim? <laughs> Congratulations, Merry Christmas. And Ian? <laughs> Ed? I've been around the church quite often this, this week. And I know these guys are really working to keep this church growing and keep people coming to the church. So thank you, and that's all I have to say. <laughs> well, thank you, Chuck, and thank you, all of you. It's, again, it's been a delight to serve you this past year and for several years now. It's a joy for us to be here. We're, we're thankful for all of you, so thank you. As we continue in this time of worship, would you join me in a, a time of, of prayer? Father God, we thank you for all that Christmas and Advent represents and means for us. We pray to you that you loved us so much that you did not leave us in our sin, but you sent your Son to be born, to take on flesh, to live among us in the midst of sin and brokenness. So easy for us to take that truth for granted, that you would send your Son. This morning as we celebrate Christmas Eve and the culmination of Advent, would we feel deep in our hearts how much you love us, that you would send your one Son to live and die for us. Would 
that not just be a truth that's stuck in our brain? Would it not just be words that leave our lips? But would our hearts feel the depth of your love for us that you would send your son? In the midst of busyness and travel and family plans and all that comes with celebrating Christmas in our culture, would we, this moment, feel the significance of what we celebrate at Christmas? Father, we thank you that you love us. We thank you that you care for us. I pray that our lives would overflow with gratitude for the way you've loved us and that we would respond by loving others in that same way. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you've heard of Jesus, you probably know about one of his famous teachings called the Golden Rule. Do to others what you would want them to do to you. And this, actually, is a restatement of something else that Jesus said, that the meaning of life is to love God and love your neighbor as yourself. Now, that's really beautiful, but what does he mean exactly by the word love? It's an unclear word in English, because you can love your mom and you can love pizza. And if the word love means the same thing in both of those cases, your mom's going to feel real bad. So what did Jesus mean in his language? Well, first of all, this love your neighbor phrase is a quotation from the Hebrew scriptures, where the word for love is ahava. However, the language Jesus spoke and taught in from day to day it was a cousin language of Hebrew, that is Aramaic, in which the word for love is rachma. But then, as Jesus' followers spread his teachings around the world, they translated them into Greek using the word agape. But here's what's fascinating. The earliest followers of Jesus who wrote the books of the New Testament in Greek, they didn't learn the meaning of agape by looking it up in ancient dictionaries. Rather, they looked to the teachings of Jesus and the story of his life to redefine their very concept of love. So one time, Jesus was asked about the most important command in the Jewish scriptures. And he first quoted from the ancient prayer in the Torah called the Shema. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart. So love for God is the most important thing. But then Jesus quickly followed up by saying another command from the Torah was also the most important, to love your neighbor as yourself. So which is the most important, loving God or loving your neighbor? Jesus' answer is yes. To ask the question means you don't get his point. For Jesus, they are two sides of the same coin. Your love for God will be expressed by your love for people and vice versa, they're inseparable. And so this makes it clear that for Jesus, agape love is not primarily a feeling for someone else that happens to you, like our phrase, I fell in love. For Jesus, love is action. It's a choice that you make to seek the well-being of people other than yourself. Jesus also went on to teach that genuine love for God and others means seeking people's well-being without expecting anything in return, especially from people who are in difficult situations who can't repay you even if they wanted to. According to Jesus, this kind of generous love reflects the very heartbeat of God. And he took this even further. Jesus said that the ultimate standard of authentic love is how well you treat the person that you can't stand. Or in his words, you shall love your enemy and do good to them, expecting nothing nothing in return. For Jesus, this kind of enemy embracing love imitates the very character of God himself. Now we wouldn't be talking about Jesus still today if he had only said things like love your enemy. This is how he actually lived. Jesus was constantly helping and serving the people around him in very practical and tangible ways. And he consistently moved towards poor and hurting people who couldn't benefit him in return. He showed love for the forgotten ones, the people who usually fall through the cracks. And when Jesus eventually marched into Jerusalem, he made himself an enemy of the leaders of his people by accusing them of hypocrisy and corruption. But then instead of attacking his enemies to overthrow them, he allowed them to kill him. Jesus died for the selfishness and corruption of his enemies because he loved them. After Easter morning, Jesus and then his followers claimed that it was the power of God's love for the world that was revealed in Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. As the Apostle Paul put it, God demonstrated his own agape for us in this. While we were still sinners, the Messiah died for us. 
Or in the words of the Apostle John, God's own agape was revealed when he sent his one and only son into the world so that through him we could have life. And for John, then, this leads naturally to the conclusion, beloved ones, if that's how God has loved us, then we ought to show love for one another. So Christian faith involves trusting that at the center of the universe is a being overflowing with love for his world, which means that the purpose of human existence is to receive this love that has come to us in Jesus and then to give it back out to others, creating an ecosystem of others-focused, self-giving love. And that's the New Testament meaning of agape love. This fourth Sunday of Advent, we remember that the reason God sent Jesus was because he loved us. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. We also remember that because God first loved us, we should love God and love other people. Matthew 22.36-39 says, Teacher, which is the most important commandment in the law of Moses? Jesus replied, You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. A second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. We like the fourth candle of Advent to remember God's love for us. God's love is so great that he gave us his one and only son so that we could have eternal life. Father God, we thank you that you do love us and you care for us and you sent your son to die for us and to show us how to love, help us to love others that way as well. Pray it now in Jesus' name, amen. by standing one more time and singing a song that talks about the ultimate aim of the plan that started at Christmas.
children in 4K through second grade can go downstairs for children's church at this time if they want. So in 2008, there was a single basketball shot that likely saved hundreds of lives. The shot took place during the quarterfinals of the SEC basketball tournament. Alabama was playing Mississippi State in the, at the Georgia Dome in Atlanta. And Alabama was down three with two seconds remaining. So Alabama takes a timeout so they can advance the ball to half court. And then from half court, they inbound the ball to, to Michael Riley. And he is well guarded just beyond the three-point line on the left wing. He's well guarded, but it's only two seconds left. So all he can do is, is throw up a shot with a hand in his face. And if the shot goes up, it, it bounces first off the back rim, then off the front rim, up off the, high off the backboard before finally falling through the hoop to tie the game which sent the game into overtime. Like it felt borderline miraculous, that shot. When if you watch the shot, it feels miraculous that it goes in at all, given how, how, how well guarded he was and how the ball bounced around. But it felt even more miraculous eight minutes later when, with the game in overtime, a tornado ripped through the parking lot of the Georgia Dome. It flipped over cars that violently shook the dome itself. And if Riley had missed that shot, many of those tens of thousands of people who were in the stadium watching the game would have been outside in that parking lot as the tornado passed through. But because Riley's shot went in, their walk to their car was delayed, and they were safely inside the Georgia Dome as the tornado passed by. The point being, that so often in life, timing is everything. If those fans had left the stadium just a little bit earlier, things would have gone very differently. And this morning, as we reach the, the climax of the Advent season, we see the importance of timing. One of the things that kind of Advent invites us to reflect on is, is how the Jewish people longed for years and years for the Messiah to come. Right? Thousands of years, they waited and waited we sing songs like, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus, and O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, to remind us how they waited. They, the songs invite us and encourage us to reflect on, on the waiting the Jews endured. And for those Jews who were waiting for that Messiah, it must have felt like, like God was slow. It must have felt like God was taking his time for no reason. It must have felt like God had forgotten them. But in Galatians 4, where we are this morning, we see that, it's, that God was not slow in sending Jesus. We see that God wasn't taking his time for no reason. He certainly hadn't forgotten his people or his promise. Instead, what we see in Galatians 4 is that God sent Jesus at just the right time. So let's see, look at Galatians chapter 4, verses 1 through 7 with me. It'll be on the screen there in your bulletin. If you have your Bible, you can look there. Galatians 4, 1 through 7 says this. Think of it this way. If a father dies and leaves an inheritance for his younger children, those children are not, are not much better off than slaves until they grow up, even though they actually own everything their father had. They have to obey their guardians until they reach whatever age their father set. And that's what it, the way it was with us before Christ came. We were like children. We were slaves to the basic spiritual principles of this world. These next four verses are where we're going to spend most of our time this morning. But verse 4, But when the right time came, God sent his son. The implication being that if God had the son at any other time, it would have been the wrong time. God wasn't waiting for no reason. God sent his son at just the right time, the perfect time. But when the right time came, God sent his son, born of a woman, subject to the law. God sent him to buy freedom for us, who were slaves to the law, so that he could adopt us as his very own children. 
And because we are his children, God has sent the spirit of his son into our heart, prompting us to call out, Abba, Father. Now you are no longer a slave, but God's own child. And since you are his child, God has made you his heir. What we see in this passage, right, that the Father sent the Son at the perfect time. I already emphasized verse 4 once in, in reading that, but it's worth reading again, right? Verse 4, when the right time came, God sent his Son. Which, of course, raises the question, which is like, what made that time the right time? What made 2,000 years ago the perfect time for Jesus to arrive on the scene? And of course, we can't fully know the mind of God. We can't fully know all his reasons. But I think there's at least two reasons for why the Father's timing was perfect in, in sending his Son. The first is that the Father's timing was perfect theologically. David Platt, writing about this passage, says this. Everything that was going on in the Old Testament was leading up to this point. The promise that Abraham had, had been given, the law of Moses had done its work to drive men to anticipate Christ, and over 300 prophecies had been given. All of it aimed toward this time. So God had used the whole of Old Testament history to set up and point toward this day that the Messiah would come. God had promised Abraham that one day he would send, he would bless the whole world through Abraham, through his offspring. God had shown the people their need of a Savior, of a Messiah, through giving them the law that they couldn't keep in their own power. He had given many prophecies that foreshadowed and pointed toward the Messiah's coming. It was all pointing to this time when God would send his Son. And so now, finally, all the promises have been promised, all the prophecies have been prophesied, the inability of the, to keep the law has been felt, the need of a Savior has been deeply felt in people's heart. And so now is the right time for God to send His Son. And it was the right time in the scheme of, of God's plan, right time theologically. But it was also the right time culturally. About 300 years before God sent Jesus. Alexander the Great created one of the greatest empires the world's ever known. It's the Macedonian Empire. And it stretched from Greece down into Egypt, all the way across the Middle East, all the way into western India. It was massive. And in building this empire, Alexander created or made Greek the official language of that empire. And because the empire was so massive, Greek became popular even in places that it, the empire didn't extend. Right? Even Alexander didn't conquer Rome, but he had made Greek such a dominant language in the world that when the Roman Empire eventually replaced Alexander's empire, Rome became bilingual, speaking both Latin and Greek. The result of all of this is that when God sent Jesus. Greek was the dominant kind of business, lingua franca, of a large swath of the Eastern Hemisphere. And that mattered because after his resurrection, Jesus is going to send his followers out. He's going to tell them to go and tell people what he has done. He's going to tell them to go and be his witnesses. And as his followers go out, obeying that command, they're able to travel from city to city and country to country, telling people about Jesus without learning new languages. Just think about Paul in this letter to the Galatians. Paul writes this letter to the churches in Galatia, which is in modern-day Turkey, where they today speak Turkish. And this letter, Paul has written about his, his experience of conversion, which he happened on the road to Damascus which is in modern-day Syria, where today they speak Arabic. He's also talked about his travels to Jerusalem in this letter, where today they speak Hebrew. And Paul's life will end in Rome, where today they speak Italian. But during this time period, thanks to Alexander, Paul could speak Greek and tell people about Jesus in Greek in all those places. 
He didn't have to learn a new language everywhere he went. He could speak Greek everywhere, and the gospel could advance. But it wasn't just the lack of a language barrier that made this the perfect time for Jesus to arrive. At the time of Jesus' coming, the Roman Empire, as I said, had kind of replaced the Greek Empire as the dominant political force in the world. And that had ushered in an era that historians call the, the Pax Romana, or the Roman peace. And during this time, there was relatively little warfare, and pretty much everyone agreed that you couldn't beat the Romans, so why try? So there's relatively little warfare. And the Romans could focus, instead of war, on building infrastructure like roads. And this meant that it was relatively safe because of the lack of war and easy because of the high-quality roads for followers of Jesus to travel and carry the message of Jesus with them. And all this together meant that the gospel, the good news about Jesus, was able to spread rapidly in the year following the, the death and resurrection of Jesus. By 100 AD, so 70 years after Jesus' death, Christianity, despite being illegal, despite being highly persecuted, had spread out of Israel into modern-day Iraq, Iran, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, Egypt, Spain, France, and even up into England. And that spread is due in no small part to the ability of early Christians to, to travel safely on Roman-built roads and share their faith with others in a common language. Now, of course, right, God could have worked to see his gospel advance if those things weren't true. But it doesn't change the fact that it was a helpful aspect and it made the Father's timing culturally perfect. Even though like, the Jews who had been waiting for a Messiah must have felt like God was taking his time for no reason, even though they must have felt like that God was slow to keep a promise, even though it must have felt like he was waiting for no good reason. Right? It turns out that God was waiting for the perfect time. Right? The Father's timing is always perfect. And that should be an encouragement to us. I think maybe there's something in your life right now that you just feel like you've been waiting for a long time for God to come along and fix. Maybe you have a, a broken relationship with a, with a child or a friend or a parent. And you've just been waiting and praying for that relationship to be restored, but it doesn't seem to be happening. Or maybe you or someone you love is fighting a chronic illness and you've been waiting and praying for healing. Or maybe you've been hoping and praying for a new or a better job or a new and better house. Or maybe you've been trying to conquer some sin in your life and you've been waiting and praying for God to give you the strength to conquer that sin. Maybe you've been hurt by someone and you're waiting for them to, to come to their senses and make things right and to heal that friendship. Whatever it is. If you're here this morning, you've been waiting for something. And it just doesn't feel like it's been happening, and you're wondering, where is God? Why won't he show up? That's you this morning. Be encouraged. God's timing is perfect. Even when we can't see it, even when we can't understand it, the all-wise, all-loving God is not slow to keep his promises. His timing is perfect. Because the Father's timing is perfect in sending His Son. But obviously, it's not just the Father's perfect timing that makes Christmas worth celebrating. Even more important than the timing is the identity of the one the Father sent. If the Father had sent a sinful human, or if the Father had sent a, a sinless but non-human angel, then Christmas would not be worth celebrating. Christmas is only worth celebrating because God sent his son. And for to grasp just why Christmas is so important, then we must understand rightly who this son is. And verse 4 tells us three important things about the son. Verse 4 tells us that the son is the son of God, 
that he was born of a woman, that he was born subject to the law. And all those things matter. So I'm going to walk through them quickly one by one. The first thing, which may seem obvious, but it's important that like, the son that is sent is, is God's son. And what is probably one of the most famous verses in the Bible, we've already heard it twice this morning, John tells us that Jesus is not just God's son, but God's only begotten son. And C.S. Lewis sums up why that phrase, only begotten, matters so much when he writes. We don't use the word begetting or begotten much in modern English. But everyone still knows what they mean. To beget is to become the father of, whereas to create is to make. And the difference is this. When you beget, you beget something of the same kind as yourself. A man begets human babies. A beaver begets little beavers. A bird begets eggs which turn into little birds. But when you make, you make something of a different kind from yourself. Now let this... Now that is the first thing to get clear. When God, what God begets is God. Just as what man begets is man. When the Bible tells us that Jesus is God's son and specifically his only begotten son, the Bible is telling us that Jesus is God. In other letters, Paul will tell us that Jesus is the, the visible image of the invisible God and that in Christ lives all the fullness of God in a human body. The son who God sent to earth is fully God. But he's also born of a woman. Jesus was born to Mary. He was raised in a, a, t- a typical child experiencing the full range of, of life experiences. Like Luke tells us that Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and all the people. Jesus grew and he learned. The point being that not only is Jesus fully God, but he's also fully human. As Jesus entered adulthood and, and began his ministry, he, he remained fully human. Throughout the Gospels, we see Jesus get hungry and thirsty and tired. We see him mourn and get angry and experience joy. We see Jesus suffer and face all the difficulties that we face. The writer of Hebrews tells us that Jesus understands our weaknesses. For he faced all the same testings we do, yet he did not sin. And it's only because Jesus was fully human that he can identify with us and help us in our times of trouble. If the Son had not been born of a woman, not been fully human, then he would not have been capable of doing all that we believe he did. And that's because part of what it means for Jesus to have been born of a woman, that he was born subject to the law. He was born with the the same obligation to perfectly keep the law that any of us are. That if, if Jesus were to have sinned, he would have been subject to the same judgment of God, just like any of us. But as we just heard from the author of Hebrews, he did not sin. To put this all together, right? Jesus is fully God, and he is fully man. Because he was fully man, he was born under the law. But unlike us, he perfectly kept the law. All those things together equip us, equip the Son to do the work that the Father gave him. Paul describes that work in verse 5. God sent him to buy freedom for us who were slaves to the law so that he could adopt us as his very own children. That the whole purpose behind the Father sending the Son was so that the Son could, could buy freedom for us who were slaves to the law. The Son's work was to buy our freedom. That was, that's what makes Christmas such a big deal. Without Christmas, without the Son coming, we aren't free. Without Christmas, we are still slaves to the law. Without Jesus, we're we're still held to the the standard of perfect obedience to the law while knowing we can't keep it. 
last week we talked about how all the rules and all the regulations in the Old Testament are there for the purpose of showing us our sin. To show us that we can't be good enough to please God on our own. We can't earn God's favor in our own power. We are slaves to sin. We can't help but to sin apart from Jesus. But then Jesus comes. He lived the perfect life we were supposed to live and failed to live. And he went to the cross and he died the death that he didn't deserve, but we did deserve in our place. He gave his life for ours, and by doing so, he bought our freedom. He made it possible for us to be made right with God, for us to have eternal life. Our standing with God, our righteousness before God has nothing to do with what we do or don't do and everything to do with what Jesus did for us. Jesus came, he lived a perfect life and then died in our place. He offered us his perfect, righteous life in exchange for our sinful life. So that when God looked at those who believe in Jesus, He doesn't see us on the basis of what we've done or not done. He sees us as if we had lived the sinless life that Christ lived. When God looks at those who believe in Jesus, he sees Christ in them. Which is why he then adopts us as his very own children, as verse 5 tells us. Because when he looks at us, he sees his child in us. When we believe in Jesus, we, like Jesus, become the Father's very own children. He makes us a child to believing in Jesus. Which is incredible. But it's even even better than that in verse 6. And because we are his children, God has sent the spirit of his son into our heart, prompting us to call out, Abba, Father. The Father not only sent the Son to make us his children, but then after that he sent the Spirit to apply that truth to our hearts. I've been thinking a lot lately about becoming a father, maybe for obvious reasons. Uh, And I just think about what a miraculous process it is. But I remember when we were having our our first child, Adelia, as soon as we found out my wife was pregnant, I, I was aware that I was now a father. And every time we'd go to an appointment and we'd hear the heartbeat or we'd see the baby on an ultrasound, the knowledge that as a father grew in me. And I thought, I had this knowledge, like I'm a father, because the baby is in, alive and in the womb. But then Adelia was born. And I, I held her in my arm for the first time. Right? And in holding her in my arms, the reality that I'm a father sunk into my heart in a, a whole new way. I became a father the the moment that baby was conceived. But it took holding that baby in my arms to apply that truth to my heart. That's what the Spirit does for us. Like We become God's child the moment He adopts us. But then He sent the Holy Spirit to apply that truth to our hearts and to make us know. Not just with head knowledge, not just intellectually, but in a deep, experiential way that we are God's children. Because we're his children, we're welcomed and we're encouraged to cry out to him, Abba, Father. That word Abba, the the Aramaic word for father, and it it communicates a sense of of intimacy, of, of warmth, of trust, of affection. Because God sent Jesus, we can be confident that that God is not just some angry, wrathful deity just waiting for us to mess up so he can chastise us. Because God sent Jesus, we can be confident that God is not some distant, aloof, divine force who started the universe in motion and then took his hands off the wheel. Because God sent Jesus to live among us and die in our place, to make us his children, we can cry out to him. 
We can know that He hears us. We can know that He wants to help us. He is our Abba. The Holy Spirit applies that truth to our lives. Two nights ago, our, our youngest son, Elijah, he woke up during the night crying. So first, my wife, who was still awake, went in and tried to console him for a while. But she put him down, and he kept crying and just wailing. So we tried to let him cry it out for a little bit, but he just kept going. And so eventually, I went in there and held him and consoled him until he, he fell asleep. Right? So I went in there, held him, and then lay by him and held his hand for a while, and eventually he fell back asleep. Now, like, because I'm a human, there was a part of me that was kind of annoyed right, by his crying. And he just, dude, dude, just go to sleep. I don't, I don't want to do this right now. I want to be sleeping. So I had that emotion. But because I'm his Abba, because I'm his father, the much larger part of me was glad that I was able to console him. I was glad that he trusted me to meet his need for comfort. If that were anyone else's child, I would have been 100% just annoyed, no sympathy whatsoever. But because it's my child, my feelings were mostly compassionate and loving and, and sympathetic towards this crying kid. I want my kids to, to feel free to cry out to me when they need me. And that's how God feels about us. But without that sinful side that gets annoyed when we call out. Because God sent his son at Christmas, we are his children. The Holy Spirit applies that truth to our hearts. And he encourages us to cry out to God as Father. He wants to hear our hearts cry, whatever that may be. And the holidays and, and Christmas in particular are not always easy. They can stir up emotions and, and pain and, and resentments and, and hurts and unsatisfied longings. All the while we feel the need to act like it's the most wonderful time of the year. But if you're here this morning, you're, you're hurting or you're walking through difficulty. Know that your Father, your Abba, desires that you cry out to Him. You don't have to put on a pious face to approach God. You don't have to have just the right words to go before Him. You can call out to Him as a child calling out to His Father. We, we celebrate Christmas. Yet God sent His Son at the perfect time in order to make us children. And remembering that first Christmas should, should cause us to remember all the ways that that benefits us, that we can be saved from our sins by the life and death of Jesus. But remembering that God sent His Son should also change how we live in the world. And in Philippians 2, there's this beautiful passage where Paul highlights many of the things about Jesus we've talked about this morning. That he is both fully God and fully man. That he came to earth for us. But what's interesting about this passage in Philippians 2, that Paul tells us all of this as a way to encourage us to treat others the way Jesus treated us. This passage is, in many ways, kind of the perfect summary of why Jesus came to earth and how we should respond. So to close our time this morning, I just want to invite you to, to close your eyes in a moment of silence and hear these words from Paul in Philippians 2 as he reflects what it means that God sent his Son. I invite you to still your heart, still your minds, hear these words from Paul about Jesus to us. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if you have any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. 
do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself. Not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interest of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to its own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing. By taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the marvelous truth that you sent your Son to take on flesh, to live among us. That you loved us so deeply that you would give your only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Are there anyone here who has not believed in Jesus for eternal life? Would you work now to reveal their need to them? And as we remember and reflect on Jesus' love for us and Jesus' humility toward us and giving up the glories of heaven to come and live among us. Would that fuel us and motivate us to live lives that are marked by love for you and love for others? We remember how Jesus humbled himself to the point of death on a cross. Would that cause us to humble ourselves, to consider others more valuable than our own, to help us look to the interests of others over our own interests? Father, we thank you for all that is represented in Jesus coming to us. We pray for boldness and willingness to live out our faith, to live like Jesus, to tell other people about Jesus, to love our enemies the way Jesus loved his enemies, to be humble the way Jesus humbled himself. Father, would the story of Christmas not just be about how it benefits us, but how it transformed our lives so we can live for the benefit of others as well. We thank you for your spirit who lives in us to transform us and to urge us to live the life you have called us to live. I pray that we would go to about our lives now, go to our holiday plans, go to be family, go amongst our neighbors and our coworkers desiring to show them Jesus. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.
that you go this morning, would you go remembering how God sent his son to make you his child? And would you go as the child of God having the same mindset as Christ Jesus? You are dismissed.